Hello and welcome to this special presentation, Australia's Coming Financial Crisis. I'm your host, Alex Saunders, CEO and founder of Nuggets News. Now, Australia has long been considered the lucky country, one of the best places in the world to live. But recently, there's been a range of headlines speculating on the future direction of the Australian property market and how it may impact our wider economy. I wanted to create a fact-based presentation to examine some of the structural changes that have taken place over recent decades to paint a clearer picture of the future direction of the Australian market. We'll be examining a wide range of statistics and data as well as cutting to interviews from fund manager Roger Montgomery and Martin North of Digital Finance Analytics. I hope you find this presentation balanced and I'm looking forward to reading your thoughts and comments in the description below. Let's get into it. Beautiful beaches, great weather and sustained economic growth. Australia has long been considered the lucky country. Here we see recent data from the World Economic Forum showing that Sydney and Melbourne continue to rank among some of the most livable cities in the world in terms of human capital, business activity and cultural experience. While many claim these cities have gotten too expensive, they continue to remain a relatively attractive option on the global stage. Australia's population has grown strongly to 25 million with 60% resulting from net overseas migration. Our population is projected to double again by 2066. Strong population growth over recent years has been one of the biggest drivers of our economy and continues to outpace that of many other developed nations. Strong population growth has meant constant demand for housing and we've seen real house price appreciation trend higher for a number of years now without any significant downturns. This chart clearly shows us the inflation adjusted return since 1960, as well as the year on year price growth. We can see the dramatic effect that reintroducing negative gearing had in 1987, as well as the introduction of the first homeowners grant in the year 2000. New research suggests Australia's 55 year bull market in housing is the longest in the world. This price action has deeply ingrained home ownership into the Australian culture and led to sayings such as home prices only ever go up and get on the property ladder at all costs. With home prices trending higher, the wealth effect is in full swing and Australian households have spent big. Household debt now exceeds 120% of GDP. Many global policy makers openly promote this wealth effect, encouraging consumers to go out and spend because they should be confident in the value of their home. This household spending has driven one of the longest periods of economic growth throughout history, 27 years or 108 quarters without a recession. However, this also means we now have an entire generation that have never experienced a recession. Many argue that we've become too entitled having never tasted any economic hardship. This record period of uninterrupted growth hasn't been without its hiccups along the way as Kevin Rudd unveiled a $10 billion stimulus plan. Many of you will remember receiving those handouts from the government during the JFC. This government stimulus package was dramatically different to that of other countries, choosing to give out money to the people rather than focus on the banks. Many argue this was one of the main drivers that helped us avoid recession. Another huge driver of economic activity throughout this period was China. Their record expansion used more concrete in three years than the United States did during the entire 20th century. These statistics are truly mind-blowing and hard to fully comprehend. Any country that grows that rapidly is going to have a huge demand for importing goods and as we can see from this 2014 data, Australia topped the list in terms of total goods exported to China. Australia is truly fortunate to have a neighbour the size of China with such a high demand for our range of natural resources. Well, believe it or not, the reason why we've had 27 years without a recession is partly good management, but mostly good luck. Take the GFC, for example, we were rescued by a resources boom. Australia has enjoyed a great run, but digging a bit deeper may reveal we're in for a reality check. So during this record period of economic activity, why has the Reserve Bank of Australia left the official cash rate so low? a measure that's only normally reserved for emergency situations such as during the GFC. High interest rates such as 14% as we saw in 1990 encourage people to deposit money in their savings account to accrue interest. 
rather than lowering interest rates which discourage savings in favour of spending any money that you may earn. Well, digging a bit deeper, we find that Australia's economy is not that robust. It actually ranks 86 in terms of economic complexity, sitting between countries like Kenya, Iran, Senegal and Kazakhstan. Economic complexity is a measure of the productive capabilities of an economy. What range of goods and services is that nation capable of producing? Many industries have evolved greatly over the past decade and we see technology stocks dominating the top 10 listed companies in the US compared to 10 years ago. You'll recognize most of these as they've become household names and you're likely one of their daily active users. Comparatively looking at Australia, not a lot has changed. Our top 10 is comprised of a resource company, five banks, two supermarkets, and a phone company, with CSL being the only shining light in the healthcare technology industry. This further highlights our lack of economic complexity, as previously discussed. Superannuation was introduced to fund the retirement of everyday Australians, but all that money needs to find a home. A great idea in and of itself to fund retirees, but when we look across the super funds, many of them are led to reinvest in the Australian banks, construction, resources, or housing industry. This high degree of exposure to Australia is a result of the local investing opportunities being relatively limited. At the moment, 9% of everyone's salary goes into superannuation, and that's seen as a huge support for asset prices. But it's wrong to think of it that way. That's the weight of money argument. Yes, it's true a proportion of that super goes into property and a larger proportion perhaps goes into the stock market. But it isn't true that the weight of money prevents crashes as we've seen in the past. The stock market has crashed on several occasions while superannuation has existed in Australia. Yeah, so here's the thing, right? The 2.7 trillion in the superannuation section, of course, most people are forced to save into it, um, is looking for a home. So that amount of money has to go somewhere. Some of it goes offshore, but a lot of it is invested locally by the fund managers here. And a lot of it flows back into both the property sector and the finance sector specifically. So what people may not understand is that the superannuation sector here is actually highly leveraged into property and into the finance sector. And if either of those went south, as perhaps is possible now, that could have a direct impact on the superannuation sector, could mean that the value will go down. And the other side of it is that the superannuation sector has been one of the forces that's been inflating property prices. Australians have enjoyed a high standard of living and many privileges, but at what cost? This leads us to Australia's company tax rates, which are now the third highest in the developed world. Despite these high tax rates, many of Australia's largest companies continue to pay little or no tax, with the burden falling on the middle and lower class. As other countries such as the US have recently undergone significant tax reforms, Australia's rates are increasingly uncompetitive. As a result, many of the smartest individuals, startups and businesses are choosing to relocate overseas. However, when examining Australia's unemployment rate, it remains at record low levels around 5%, second only to before the GFC when we saw a sharp increase. A rise in unemployment goes hand in hand with economic downturns or recessions. So if everyone has a job, what are they doing? And what we find is the trend has been an increasing service sector and less growth in high-paying, high-skilled jobs. 67% of the Australian economy now comes from service sector jobs. What that has meant over the last four or five years in particular is that banks have preferred to lend to housing. And it means that small businesses in particular have found it very, very difficult to get the credit they need for productive purposes to grow their businesses. So we're in the situation where Australia is effectively not growing as it should because the credit availability for productive purposes is not available. Whereas the banks have just chased ever more home lending, 
which of course was way profitable until quite recently. But now that growth is tailing away, and that being, means that the banks now have an issue in terms of their profitability going forward as well. So we've created ourselves one massive headache. So when we look at an industry such as manufacturing, we can see that Australia has lost 24% of all manufacturing jobs in the past five years. This trend is known as outsourcing and it's a result of the same task or labor being cheaper to perform overseas. This trend is increasingly apparent in the car manufacturing industry, losing 50,000 jobs in the past 12 months alone. We all know that friend or family that used to work at the local manufacturing plant that's now shut down. The latest data shows us that manufacturing has fallen from 14% of GDP in 1990 to just 5% in 2017. Abundant resources have generated great wealth for Australia, but do we need to be mindful of mining? Australia is a resource rich country and we've become increasingly reliant on exports. Although we're a relatively small country population wise, we're the 22nd largest exporter in the world and here we can see the total value of all goods exported. Our global neighbours have enjoyed importing our wide range of natural resources. However, global growth rates are slowing and countries like China are increasingly needing less of our resources, particularly when you consider all the ghost cities they've built. Our largest export is iron ore and they're going to be using a lot less steel going forward. Another one of our largest exports is coal. Australia is the largest exporter of coal in the world, supplying 36% of the world's coal. However, countries are increasingly becoming more mindful of climate change. The United Nations Paris Agreement is just one example of their commitment to move away from dirty energy such as coal towards greener, more renewable sources. Tying this all together explains why Australia has experienced such low wage growth. We're too reliant on these older industries and we don't have enough high paying, high skilled jobs. Ideally, we want wage growth to track or outpace inflation. Otherwise, the cost of goods or services becomes unaffordable for the average person, resulting in a decreased standard of living. Well, it's difficult for any country to say that they're reliant on any particular sector. Inevitably, they all are reliant on some sectors more than others. In Australia, that happens to be retail, uh, and it also happens to be construction and resources. Construction is the third largest employer in this country after healthcare and retail, uh, and it will continue to be important in uh, providing jobs and income. There's good debt and there's bad debt, but is Australia's household debt a positive or a negative? So although our wages aren't growing, households have continued to spend. Here we see the latest figures showing household debt to disposable income hitting record levels of 200%, some of the highest in the world. For many households, the largest chunk of their debt comes from their mortgage or second investment properties of which they can negatively gear. Household debt is a big issue. We have a record level of household debt to GDP, a record level of household debt to income, record credit card debt, record auto loan debt, and record personal debt. There, whether it's a country, uh, a, a company, or an individual, when you have very high levels of debt, you can't spend as much in the future. What you've done is you've brought forward your expenditure, and that means future spending needs to be lower until that debt is paid off. And we call that deleveraging. Another hotly debated topic is negative gearing, particularly as we approach the election. Many argue that this creates further incentives to invest in the property market and allows investors to offset losses, further creating that incentive to invest and inflate housing prices. Many investors would be far less willing to take on such large amounts of debt if this offset was not available. With regard to negative gearing, again, I think that mistake was made some years ago. Uh, and what it's done is essentially given people with property and particularly multiple investment properties, the opportunity to pay 
uh, for those through taxpayer rebates. So in other words, the broader taxpayer community is helping those property investors outbid and outlast most other types of property purchases. So it has distorted the market. It doesn't actually lead to the right outcomes and I think it should be removed. Our love for property has led many Australians to place their bets. Banking on construction. With home prices forever increasing, we've seen a huge run up in construction. Here we see the National Crane Index representing 735 cranes across Australia, over 300 in Sydney alone. To put this into perspective, the 14 largest cities in the US have only 130 cranes combined. Here we see the exponential growth in the number of houses and units under construction across Australia since 2008. Now this is particularly apparent across New South Wales and Victoria, obviously led by Sydney and Melbourne respectively. So who's funding all this construction? Well, it's the big four banks, and we can see that their mortgage books are equivalent to 80% of our entire economy. Because of the fractional reserve nature of banking and mortgage lending, we see exposure as high as 900% for Bendigo Bank relative to their market capitalization. The Australian stock market is unusual in a number of ways. Uh, we have an enormous exposure, uh, about 17% exposure to resources, and we have an almost equally high exposure to financials. Now, believe it or not, the big four banks represent 27% of our stock market index. And that compares perhaps unfavourably uh, to other indices in the world where banks represent a much smaller component. It does mean that if you think the banks are going to do well, you have to have a very large number of banks and a large proportion of your portfolio in them in order to beat the market. Scratching beneath the surface reveals some sad truths about home ownership rates. Despite all this lending and construction, actual home ownership rates continue to trend lower across just about every age bracket. These low home ownership rates can be explained by housing affordability. We've seen it trend away from the historical averages, particularly across capital cities. In Sydney, it will now take 13 times the median income to afford a home. So if housing is no longer affordable and home ownership is decreasing, then who's buying all these houses? And what we've seen is a huge increase in investor and interest only loans, tripling since the 2008 financial crisis, reaching $600 billion of loans. Now that interest only portion of total bank loans was as high as 45% before the regulators stepped in and put measures in place to dramatically reduce that exposure. Regulators recently unwound these restrictions to further encourage investment lending. Now it's important to keep those two figures in mind, $600 billion and 45% investor loans in Australia when we compare it to what brought about the GFC. Across the whole of the US, they had $600 billion of subprime loans, which accounted for 23% of all mortgage lending at the time. We know this resulted in the greatest financial crisis in history. These subprime loans were handed out to consumers who in reality could not afford them. Here we see the total amount of those loans broken down by year and when that interest only period is coming up for renewal. Now many of these investors will be forced to switch to principal and interest, increasing their repayments. The largest chunk of these loans, over $250 billion, is set to roll over in 2019 and 2020. One of the big risks for banks and for our country is the very high proportion of interest only loans. A UBS survey late last year revealed that a large percentage of people with interest only loans didn't even know that they had interest only loans. An equally large number, if not an even larger number of people with interest only loans said that they chose those features because it gave them better financial flexibility. One could read into that what they like, but I suspect it means they couldn't afford a principal and interest loan. If interest rates go up, 
eventually the uh, piper has to be paid uh, and in that event uh, it'll be costly either to pay back the loan or to move from interest only to principal and interest. We've now reached the period for these mortgages to be rolled over and what we're seeing is a sharp increase in the number of loans rejected. Banks have tightened their lending standards as well as the number of people realizing that they cannot afford the principal and interest on their home and they may be forced to sell. This chart clearly shows a tenfold increase in the number of rejections for those trying to refinance their home. It's little wonder these rejection numbers are so high when we consider the percentage of income spent on mortgage payments. Remember, this is with interest rates at record lows. As interest rates rise, these repayment levels only become more unsustainable for Australian families. Yes, yeah, so unfortunately, we've had a generation of bad lending and many people got loans that they should never have got. The Royal Commission showed that over the last 12 months. And now the chickens are coming home to roost, partly because incomes are flat, cost of living are rising, people have got very large mortgages, and of course, we've seen some interest rate rises relatively recently. So my research says more than a million households are now in mortgage stress and have cash flow issues relating to their mortgage repayments on a, on, your, on a monthly basis. And it's also worth saying that the rate of increase in mortgage stress is accelerating. And that's simply because incomes have been flat for, for so long and people are highly leveraged into the, seg the sector. So what that basically takes us to is that we have a large number of households who are actually in difficulty at a time when home prices are now falling. And so as well as mortgage stress, I also look at negative equity. In other words, your mortgage is worth more than the value of your property. And now we're seeing more households caught with that downward force too. So you put those two things together and the, outlooks, and the outlook looks pretty wobbly ahead. Australia is going to require strong growth if the high supply of housing and units is to be met with equal demand. So do we have the population growth to mop up this excess supply in housing? As we discussed at the start of this presentation, Australia has experienced strong population growth for a number of years. However, this is now trending lower. One of the trends we're seeing is Australians putting off having children to later in life and having smaller families. The fertility rate was 3.5 in 1960 and that's decreased to just 1.8 in 2016. These changing demographics tend to be a headwind for economic growth. Well, obviously many people will actually say migration is the way to solve the problem because if you bring more people into the country, you can give them jobs and they can generate more economic activity in the country. Um, and by the way, they can perhaps mop up some of the spare capacity in terms of all that new construction that's going on at the moment, the 200,000 units coming on a year. The problem we've got is that in fact, migration just puts more pressure on our infrastructure. It doesn't necessarily solve our problem. And if you look at, for example, GDP per capita, which takes out of uh, the equation, the growth, it looks a lot worse than the GDP overall number. So my view is that migration is actually a false signal in terms of creating the right outcomes that we need. And I think we should actually be much more careful in terms of the way we manage the growth in our economy, because just being bigger with more people isn't necessarily going to solve our economic issues. Here we see the latest auction clearance rate data. Fewer buyers and increased supply has led to a dramatic decrease in weekly clearance rates across capital cities. At their peak in 2015, auction clearance rates were as high as 80%. Recent data suggests that figure has since halved. When digging deeper, it's often a case of follow the money. Many people argue that this situation we find ourselves in has snuck up on us and could not have been avoided. But a secret report by APRA in 2007 showed that lax lending standards by the Australian banks would threaten to push the number of borrowers who could not pay their home loans to dramatic and unprecedented levels that could bring about a serious recession or banking crisis. This report was later buried. <laughs> 
It's crazy to think the regulators knew this was a risk and chose to do nothing. Yes, so in fact, if you go back and look, there were a number of reports written around the time warning about the risks in the finance system and specifically related to the way that mortgage lending was working uh, and other things too. But that, <laughs> that report was rather conveniently buried. And of course, for a number of years, the Reserve Bank basically used the household sector and their ability to consume more thanks to bigger credit availability and bigger mortgages to stoke the economy as the mining boom went away. The trouble is now we've created ourselves one huge issue and frankly we're now in the situation where the amount of debt in the system is so high that it's unlikely that it will be repaid in an orderly fashion and that then creates significant broader economic risks over the next 10 years or so. So why are reports being buried and why the inaction from government? Well, as always, follow the money. And what we see is that a huge percentage of state government revenue comes from collected stamp duty and land transfer tax. Transparency International recently opened an investigation into the corruption in global real estate markets. This report focused on 10 main areas of concern. What they found was shocking. Australia topped the list having deficiencies in all 10 of their real estate corruption criteria. With so much investment from China over the years, it makes you wonder what percentage of that is resultant of money laundering. Anyone active in this industry will tell you it's no wonder that Australia has recently undergone a royal commission into the misconduct across the banking, superannuation and financial services industries. The results have been handed down and we now wait to see the repercussions of the report. Owning a home has long been considered the great Australian dream. It's quite normal in other countries to rent. We see rental rates as high as 56% in European countries like Switzerland. Recent data suggests millennials are far more likely to be comfortable renting than their parents. So while 89% of millennials plan to purchase a home in the future, 72% say that they cannot afford to buy. We may see an increase in the number of renters as we've witnessed in other countries. That is, unless we see further incentive from state governments such as the first home owner and builders grants. Now, many people argue against these, saying that they're just another measure to further inflate home prices. Yeah, there's been a range of packages put out over the years to try and encourage property ownership. And I think the first owner grant is probably one of the biggest mistakes because what it does is simply lift all the boats in the harbour. In other words, the property prices go up by the amount of the first homegrown grant. So it doesn't actually give you any differential benefit. Uh, and in fact, if I look at my stress data, it's the first time buyers who were bribed into the market over the last two or three years that actually are the ones now doing it really tough. So it really hasn't worked for first time buyers. Low interest rates, money printing and quantitative easing. Central banks to the rescue. So while governments may try different stimulus and incentive measures, many countries around the world are increasingly reliant on central bank activity. Printing money and dropping interest rates to zero to stimulate the economy as the last resort. Are we going to see the Reserve Bank of Australia take similar action? If the RBA do take these actions, ultimately they'll be sacrificing the Aussie dollar. Now we've already seen it fall from over $1.10 to below 70 cents recently as markets start to price in weakening economic activity and the increased chances of easy money policy from the RBA. It's important to note that a lower Aussie dollar would help our exports but hurt our imports making them relatively more expensive. Finally, I want to bring your attention to APRA's recent crisis management powers. Now, many argue that this is Australia's form of bail-in laws, meaning if things go south, your deposits will be used to save the banks rather than belonging to you. 
Remember, when you deposit money in a bank legally, you are now accredited to them. And we've seen this happen in the past in places like Cyprus. There's still plenty of positives when examining Australia's longer term outlook. Long term, I think Australia will do very well thanks to its proximity to Asia. Uh, but we do have to add value to our exports to ensure that we don't sell all of our assets in order to pay for our profligate spending. It's going to be vital that we uh, increase the value of our exports by adding value to those exports uh, and that might mean finding new industries. The way to do that of course is to incentivise people to start new businesses and the way to do that as many other countries have done is by lowering taxes or giving tax holidays to start up businesses. Yeah, so if you look at the uh, main measures, GDP is probably a good one to start with. Um, about half of GDP is related to household consumption. Now, because households are under the gun, um, flat incomes, rising costs, big mortgages, uh, all the evidence suggests they're spending less, their savings are being run down. And that means that going forward, I suspect that we're going to see less contribution from the household sector to GDP. We also know that whilst the resource sector is doing relatively well thanks to the exchange rates. The fact is that many other segments are actually struggling. And as a result of that, uh, what it means is that the broader growth across the economy is also in difficulty. Look at retail, for example. So going forward, I think our GDP number is going to look pretty sick. I also expect the employment number to begin to change to the point where unemployment starts to rise again. And the trouble there is that as unemployment starts to rise, that creates a feedback loop then into households who suddenly find that they can't afford to repay their mortgages anymore. So I think we're at a very important tipping point. And unfortunately, the forward leading indicators do not look very positive. Now, having seen this presentation and the wide range of data that we've presented, what do you think about the future direction of the Australian economy? Are households too heavily indebted? Is recession inevitable or will Australia adjust to the demands of a modern economy with immigration and growth helping us pull through? I'm looking forward to reading your thoughts and comments in the description below and I hope you've enjoyed this presentation. If you have, please hit that like button, subscribe, share this video with friends and family and thanks for tuning in guys. Cheers.